first time I heard George Lewis play Burgundy Street Blues, I was enthralled, and I decided that I really wanted to make music like that myself. It was the spring of 1962, I just turned 13, and I'd never seen anything like that before. The place was Preservation Hall, it was just a kind of hole in the wall, splintery floors, a few benches, a lot of old dark smoky paintings on the wall, and five or six musicians who were playing the most extraordinary music I'd ever heard in my life. And of course there was George Lewis on the clarinet. The sound of his clarinet was something absolutely angelic. And I was taken with a passion for that music that has never left me. It wasn't long after that that I got my hands on my first clarinet and I began to learn the music. George Lewis took me under his wing. I took lessons with him and learned at the feet of all those wonderful old masters. It was the beginning of my apprenticeship alongside some of the city's legendary old black jazz men. They became my idols, my mentors. They taught me about their music, of course, but they taught me more than that. They taught me about their world, their neighborhoods, their humor, their anger, their courage in the face of poverty and prejudice, and sickness and death. But most of all, they taught me their humanity. They called themselves the men's. Well, my father's the one who brought me to the men's. He's one of these tragic, romantic kind of southern figures you'd meet in the Tennessee Williams play. He was a journalist and a writer. He had a great early career in the magazine business in New York. He was a real rabble-rouser in the early civil rights movement, a, a fiery polemicist and a, and a committed believer in racial equality. And when he found this place, Preservation Hall, with these musicians whose music he loved, these, these men he respected so much, it was like an oasis of humanity in his troubled life and he brought me into that world. And it was a real revelation. It opened the door to a completely new universe that I'd never suspected. So there I was, a young middle-class white teenager in New Orleans at the tail end of the Jim Crow era. Louisiana was still officially a segregated state when I first started listening to that music. So it was an unlikely fraternity for a young white boy to join, but I joined it. And I learned at the feet of some wonderful musicians and wonderful men. It was George Lewis, of course, the world-renowned clarinet player who toured the world from Stockholm to Tokyo. There was the trumpet player, Punch Miller, who had been an early friend and rival of Louis Armstrong. There was George Gano, a bitter, impassioned Creole banjo player. I took lessons with Gano, and he told me some amazing things about the South, about New Orleans, about race, about the Creoles, and, of course, about music. And Sweet Emma the Bell Gal, Sweet Emma, who wore a garter belt, with, with bells on it that jingled when she played. She scared me the first time I saw her because I thought she looked like Marie Laveau, the voodoo queen. Mainly, I learned from the brass bands. Harold Dejan asked me to come and join his Olympia brass band and I played a lot of parades and funerals with the Olympia, marching all day long through the hot, humid streets of New Orleans with the second liners, the, the, those dancers, the black dancers doing these wonderful, writhing, sensual dances all around the band. And sometimes, There'd be gunfire and brickbats thrown and bottles as tempers flared on those hot streets. That was all part of the life down there. I call this book Song From My Fathers. It's a song for my white father who sired me and raised me and taught me, but also for the black fathers who inspired me and encouraged me and enriched my life beyond measure. It also recounts the life and times of a middle-class white boy growing up in New Orleans in the 1950s and 60s. New Orleans is really more than a backdrop to this drama. It's perhaps a central player, because this story could not have taken place in any other city in the world. The book was actually written several years before Hurricane Katrina smashed into New Orleans and changed its face forever. In the wake of that cataclysm, these memories may seem especially poignant and nostalgic. In fact, the New Orleans of which I speak had mostly faded into history long before Katrina struck a victim of time, progress, and the eternal passing of generations. But this is the way it was.